like Rolex. Why only Rolex? Samarina and I don't know. Look black one, Samarina. Yeah. Here you go. Very good price for you. Wow, uh, those are some pretty cool minute markers. How much is this? This glass, look, this sapphire glass, no water noise. Okay, cool. So, uh, how much? 1500. Alright, so, and that's in bot. But how much you pay? Well, I gotta think about it. Uh, I, I don't have any money yet, so I need to change money. But okay, change after right here. Cool, man. Thank you. Okay. A Bangkok bluesy. Note the frogfoot coronet, and that cyclops needs help. Now this is a quartz piece, and when it comes to fake Rolex watches, I would want a quartz because then it's going to be at least somewhat accurate. Now this is a mechanical watch, and so the accuracy really is up in the air. And hey, this has a radial dial. Now, radial dials, I just thought were on GMTs. And I'm talking about the elongated minute marks. That's what a radial dial is. As far as pre-ceramic fakes go, aside from that Cyclops issue, it's a really attractive watch. He wants 135 USD for it, but that's very negotiable. As far as the quartz pieces, I think you can get them down to about 500 baht, but you're gonna need to bargain. All right, my very first visit to an authorized dealer in Bangkok. This time around, I went a couple of years ago and the system was different. They didn't have any lists. And last time I was there, I stumbled upon a deep sea, an all black deep sea. And I was told, and they were very open about it, that you needed to spend 50,000 USD to really get into the realm of the steel sports watches. And of course, now you've got exhibition pieces this is a BLNR on a Jubilee bracelet. Notice it's running, as is this Pepsi. So these aren't fake watches, and unlike Japan, you can try them on, and you'll see in a future video I tried on a couple pieces. By the way, note the, quote, blue on the bezel. I mean, it looks purple. It kind of reminds me of those first-generation ceramic Pepsis. And the matte dial on the Sea Dweller is kind of surprising. I mean, I don't even know how I feel about it. It's, well... There's so many other things they could do besides just that flat matte look. But it's a nod to some of the vintage Rolexes of the past. A white dial Daytona and a two-tone Daytona. And of course, I did go in the shop. Welcome to Watch Symposium. I'm Austin. All right, so I stopped by a Thai authorized dealer and there was like nobody in the store, but still I had to wait five minutes. And then when I went in, there was a British guy that was told to wait and he was giving them hell the whole time saying I just want to look at the display models and it's kind of funny to see one couple in the store and then tell you to wait and say so busy but when I walked in they asked me what model I was interested in I told them and they took out a phone to put in my details and I told them I don't live in Thailand is that okay they said yes so they're gonna send me an email and they said they would keep the piece a week and I guess I'd be flying here to get that piece I requested now there's about a point zero 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 one percent chance that's gonna happen but you know I filled out my information they played the part well and I felt heard and that's something you don't feel at authorized dealers in Japan you know they don't take your name down they just shrug their shoulders when you ask them how you get a piece, tell you to come back, like things are gonna change when you come back. They won't. You're not gonna stumble upon one of these pieces. You leave, they haven't taken your information down and, and you just, you know that it's never gonna happen and they don't give a shit, all right? But frankly, and here, even though the piece is almost certainly not going to happen for me, I have that small glimmer of hope. And it was that uh, etiquette of putting me on the waiting list and, and hearing me. And that means something. It's interesting because, you know, when you go to these authorized dealers, you know you're not going to get a piece, but it's interesting to see how they handle you. And... 
they handled me well here. I felt listened to. I felt respected. And, you know, last time I was in Thailand, they said to get steel sports models, you need to spend $50,000 on other pieces. And they had a tutor shop connected to this Rolex place and I think a, an, another shop. And those are the kind of pieces you probably need to spend 50,000 USD on to get the piece that I requested. But still, sitting there filling out my information was far better than the shrug of the shoulders, come back soon, and maybe something will happen that you get in Japan. All right. But there are always well-priced Rolexes if you know where to look. If you're willing to compromise slightly on authenticity and greatly on quality. But the advantage is that you can find some really unique pieces. I mean, this is a five-digit ceramic, or another way to look at it, a six-digit pre-ceramic. From what I understand, the red ceramic, even for Rolex, is really hard to deal with. So perhaps the counterfeiters are just like, screw it, we're not even going to try it. Let's just do it in aluminum. You can see the real deal on the right. Looks like the counterfeiters need to work on the bezel insert, and those numerals are too close to the dial. And the crown, of course, is a big problem. And the minute hand, it's too short. I don't know if you caught that, but there's a sticker that says 904L. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's probably not authentic 904L steel. Another GMT, the solid yellow gold root beer. Take a moment. What looks off to you? Aside from the obvious weird crown and the too short minute hand and the cyclops and date window that's kind of weird the font on the bezel insert it's too crowded near the 22 and 23 and of course there are just other problems i mean the whole thing just kind of looks off a blnr and aside from the problems that we've thus far mentioned that 24 hour hand is looking pretty stubby and look at that date window and that numeral one for the date oh that's hurting all right, a sky dweller with an intense white dial. That's actually what Rolex calls this dial color, intense white. How can the absence of color be any more intense? This is a flawless rendition. I mean, look at the sweeping second hand. I mean, this would fool the president of Rolex himself. Now, this really is probably one of the most accurate of these fakes, and this is trying to be the first generation ceramic bluesy, the 116613. And you can tell that because it's got the gold writing as opposed to the white writing, which the modern version has. And the gold looks a little bit off in the date window, but if you saw this on somebody's wrist on, say, the train, it probably would pass muster from a distance and a Sprite, and it's got all of the problems that the BLNR and the root beer had, but hey, you know, at least the counterfeiters are keeping up with the ultra-modern, newest of the new Rolex watches. Now, is this the perfect balance between a pre-ceramic and a ceramic piece, or is it a hellish spawn from the bowels of China? All right, stop dancing, calm down, take your seats. The video is resuming now. As you know, I wore the Iconaut during this trip and Kristoff nails it in this comment. Bangkok really is a pretty safe place unless you hit those dark back alleys, which I hit. Come with me, I'll show you one. Now, would I have been all right with a Rolex watch? Yeah, I would have been fine, but it just takes the pressure off, takes the worry off. I remember being in Phnom Penh in Cambodia and I wore the Explorer 2 there and one night I was being driven back to my hotel by this kind of sketchy tuk-tuk driver. It was in the middle of the night and he got lost and the next thing I know I'm in the middle of nowhere with this sketchy guy and the biggest source of worry was the Explorer 2 because I didn't think this guy wanted to kill me unless I didn't give him the Explorer 2. Now it never came to anything. Uh, eventually, we passed this middle-of-the-night fish market, and I bailed. I ended up going to that fish market, talking with like some fishermen, and 
one of them called a tuk-tuk driver. He came and, um, and that guy took me back to my hotel. And that other tuk-tuk driver followed me for a while in that other tuk-tuk, but he didn't get paid, man. I mean, I gave him my hotel card and he couldn't even figure it out. So you have one job, dude. You didn't do it. You don't get any money from me. So what I'm doing here is I'm going from Sukhumvit Road to Pechabuti Road. There's a river that runs in between, but on Soy 11, there's a footpath. You cross that bridge and you can get there to Pechabuti. And there it is right there. Uh, indeterminate as to my location. Generally, I know where I am, generally. This is Pechabuti Road right here. Uh, even this way. Back where, from where I came. 